got your thing? I'll watch this page. Okay. Can I put my wine in your chair? Like you can. I'm, I won't be there. Ah, oh, welcome. It's nice to have you all here. I'm going to keep this short and sweet today. Um, two things. I, I, when I, we were first talking about doing this, uh, Jim said, oh, it's too soon. We, we just read for you. And it reminded me that um, one of the uh, founding principles, I think, one of the things that really hooked my imagination when I was first starting to go to readings in San Francisco, and are you rolling, by the way? Yes. Ask you, I'm sorry. Yes. Tomas on the video, thank you today, buddy. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's rolling. Rolling. It's rolling. It's rolling. It's rolling. It's rolling. It's rolling. It's rolling. No, but when I first started to go to readings in San Francisco, one of the things that Robert Duncan kept talking about was that for him, and especially coming out of the period in Berkeley in, in the 40s, was that uh, poetry readings, uh, in, or actually reading the poem, as he would have put it, uh, aloud, was far more important than being put into a magazine someplace. And he said this often enough that it sort of became mantra to me as, as a way to proceed but he saw the uh, gathering up, as we have just done, of people, whoever can be here in the community, and uh, of presenting your work back to those people that you're working with them to be far more important than some guy sitting in, you know, it, for him it would have been in New York, you know, opening the magazine that you had your, your poem into. I mean, he had no problem with magazine publication. That was the lovely thing about Mr. Duncan is he never said, he was, he was not binary. It was not this or that. It was like, this is what's important to me. Here's why. But of course, I do that too. And, and that was the lovely lesson. So uh, you guys become uh, today the first. Uh, this is the first the, uh, repeats, as Jim put it. But to me, what this actually does is it finally sets the series where I hope it can continue. Uh, I mean, in my fantasy, uh, it would be, uh, Ruth, if you, you know, had a, a new stack of poems that you were sitting on that you thought, I need to get these out. Um, that I would get a phone call. That, that would be where things were really rolling in, in the best possible way. And so that people were coming to you and saying, I got this going, I got that going. And then things, I mean, with the, uh, the old series, things start to sail on, on right on their own without, it, it really had nothing to do with me <laughs> after a while. It was just sort of, if I don't screw this up, maybe this will go on, which it did until the restaurant closed. So it's wonderful to have you two here because uh, your friends, uh, I, I consider you both dear friends. Um, after the winter we've all had uh, between Garrett and Patricia and uh, the news of Mr. Corbett, um, it's wonderful to have family here and to um, actually poetically hug each other and to be together as we have been for the last few readings. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's lovely that it all combines up to, like I said, set the series under the keel that I wanted on, gets you back in. And uh, it brings Mr. Dunn to us, and um, yeah, who I believe, since you were here last, you received the laurels from Miss Davis at the Harvard Library, mm -hmm. yes. which was uh, lovely, light, and, and so, so deserved uh, as, as a thing. Because, as I said, the first time you came here, and I've said to Jim in private, um, he's one of the people in our community that are working on a large number of things. He's working on his own work. He's doing work with wieners. You have a long history with both Bill uh, and Press Wafer and Bootstrap, which is, and we have people coming, actual strangers too. How strange! Oh, no, it's, it's not. Audrey. It's, it's Audrey. She cut her hair. She looks right so in. strange, that bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't even recognize her. You know. She looks really fancy. Yeah, she does. You know. I have too fancy this crowd. Like <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, We're sorry. sold out. We're sold out. Oh, 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 hey, I didn't recognize you with your hair. Let me, um, we've got extra chairs here that we need to pull out now. I think there's some seats here. Nolan, how are you doing? Hi. Welcome. Thank you. I'll let y'all get settled in. Oh. So, uh, nice to have you. Um, what, what I was, I guess I thought that here because I was talking about Jim. And I was talking about uh, how what this does is this having uh, Amanda and Jim Reed uh, gets us up 
in, as far as the series into the, the place that I wanted to be, which is having uh, people in the community returning and coming back. And so Jim, uh, who's been doing all this work, uh, I, I mean that I so deeply respect. Um, at the same time, I, with other poets, uh, Wiener's most formally, I think. Um, also, you completed your education, <laughs> which is something that John Wiener said to Garrett Lansing. It, 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 we, we, this was at one of uh, the uh, summer poetry, alternative poetry conferences back in the olden days, and Garrett stood up and just gave this blistering reading that we were all just sitting there holding our breaths. It was so good. And John got up in his ineffable way of fumbling with things, sort of uttered out of the side of his mouth. He's glad to see that Mr. Lansing has been proceeding to practice his poetry writing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great that Mr. Dunning has been, while he's doing all this, continuing to write wonderful, wonderful poetry. And it's fabulous to have you here today. Please welcome Mr. James Dunning. <laughs> And it really is an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be reading with Amanda. Um, I think it was 11 years ago at the PA Lounge we read together, uh, and uh, we got really drunk. <laughs> and I did my uh, William Burroughs imitation, and uh, it's funny how, you know, going through Amanda's uh, book, how, uh, you know, I was telling Ruth this a second ago, like, uh, to me, poetry is friendship. It sounds so corny, you know. But through Garrett, it was such a generous clue that he was, that, uh, I trying to embody it or you know or walk away from it. So I might do both tonight. Thank you, Rich. All right, uh, Garrett was a uh, was was such a, a true and uh, generous friend, but a great poet. And uh, every reading that he attended, I'd read these two poems written for him uh, about him with him in it. Well wishers, the coin falls eternally. No splash can match the scream a quarter makes when it is tossed by a one hand. The black stillness is a quiet, dark mirror reflecting the silent wishes long forgotten. A girl with a garland in her hair kneels fawn-like beside the stone well, picking flowers for her crown. She came to me in an envelope at the Edgar Casey Center in Virginia Beach in a clairvoyancy class. I stumbled across her in my mind as a Puritan resting beside a butter churner. To coin a Hollywood phrase with a small dog licking your face, I wish you all the time. Wishing Wells. Lighthouse eyes shine New York City neon winter blue. A monk among us with strange invocations who robed us in words. Sitting on the Senator's Louisburg Square doorstep on Mount Hordom, sharing stolen chocolate covered secrets from Starbucks. The downward tree grows earthly in your heavenly hands. Regarding the city from the grand windows of the brick Sears Tower, the Charles River ribboned under the Smoot and Longfellow, Swimming back from Kettle Island, I caught a tiny glimpse of you waving from Magnolia Beach on the 4th of July as holiday boaters aimed recklessly for my unseen bobbing head floating on the sea. You carried the secret of the fisherman and his catch, the sinking boat and the sea, the land and its pinings in the palm of your soul. And, uh, we used to walk around East Gloucester together, and this is part of the bigger poem. It's, just, it's really, I boiled it down to what it really was, which is toward the future thunder. Walking with wings on our feet, guarded by the golden chariot of the lost sleeping lion, roiling like ocean clouds, toward the future thunder of your harbor home. You walk with the gait of a gardener, open and true. Your breathing is freer. Your heart keeps time unconfined, free to roam through unchecked clocks and stopped watches dusted with stillness. And uh, on uh, November 4th, 2017, this copy for Jim Dunn with love. It might be the last poet, poem Garrett wrote, or maybe the last one that he shared with anyone, or maybe not. Um, and I, uh, I was talking to him about it, and he mentions the dog barking in here. It's a very specific memory. And I said, oh, whose dog was that barking? That's no one's dog. I made it up. <laughs> but he's very concerned that this was too personal and maybe a little too sentimental. So this is a Garrett poem? It is. This is a Garrett poem. Thank you. It's called An Afternoon of Tottering Clouds. Helene and Hetty were sitting on my porch, talking of bygones and the men who went away. There was to be a festival. Blue the day, and air was thin but warm. In the park, 
in, a, in the park, a dog barked fitfully. Be gone, someone said. Phantoms be gone. How to keep a shape from slipping on a slope that steepened as sunset loomed. We thought a drink might save us. <laughs> so that's Garrett's poem. Right. What was it? <coughs> Uh, yeah, he wrote it uh, right around the same time in November, and he gave it to me. November seventeenth, he read it to me and said, "I'm really, I'm really, really excited." Yeah, he was very excited about it. I think he might have gave it to Tomas for Doris Magazine, so it might it might be in the process of being published, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, so, as I said, I am a man's fluffer today, and I'm proud to just fluff you up. Uh, and I, I'm going to read poems that that I think uh, are a little weird and different, and a little from last time, and I've I really. Uh, Spent some time with these. Now, this is a poem about uh, an acid trip at a at, at a uh, at a dead show in New Jersey. And uh, the one thing I need to tell you is, I was driving. I had, I had a spiritual, a really spiritual moment. But it starts in a in John Wiener's apartment. It goes to New Jersey, and then it ends up in Manhattan. Uh, but it, it, uh, from from the hills of uh, uh, of Hoboken. So that's all you need to know. But I was driving about. A, a, about 90 miles an hour with my wife, and I wasn't looking at the road, and I kept saying, we're in the palm of God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the fuck I live, but I live to, to, and the, the first line is, is stolen from John Wieners. Now the season of the furnished room is, uh, I stole it, now, now the season of the furnished dream. The clouds here are made of sunlight. It pours through my hands in a golden fog. Three rooms shaped like the Trinity, spiritually leaping from God to cloud. Cherubs plastered on the wall, their silence reminds us of afternoon, allowing us a vision of her with hair all the way down the back side of the hill, the empty street approaching the invisible magic hour. The hollow neon ball is passed from soldier to angel, over the right shoulder like a mercury ball of hidden knowledge, passed back and forth repeatedly in secret formation. The moon had her eye on their open hands, gathering tail light flowers, spreading potent flashes of mad bulbs. The dance is repeated subconsciously by a nation of matchsticks unlit. The borders are circled by blue lights and bullhorns. We are untouchable. We are in the palm of God. Lower Manhattan from the hills of Hoboken twinkles like Christmas lights unscrewed. Heaven shines in a loft with a freight elevator. Dirty windows crisscross with chicken wire, fire sirens, police engines, traffic growling, the shouts of people on the street. Now, the season of the furnished dream. Um, for years, uh, I think the uh, Caravaggio painting, The Taking of Christ, was lost in, in, in a Jesuit in a monastery in, uh, in, in uh, Dublin, Ireland. So it was found like in 1999, and uh, they brought it to, to, to BC. And I thought that was really cool that uh, Caravaggio's in there, he's holding up the light, and, uh, and that's all. So I wrote this poem uh, looking at that painting. I never read it. I, I lost it and I just found it, so I figured I'd pretend I just wrote it. Um, <laughs> in 1999. So, it, The Taking of Christ. The murderer holds the light, the sinner creates the light. The black armor of the Roman guard shines with the light. But where does the light come from? Does it come from the kiss? Is it the Father's enlightenment that makes the betrayal so real? Jesus intertwines his fingers like a collapsed steeple, his anguished expression, his soled eyes glancing downward, like let lit with the pain of the prophecy. Peter cries out to heaven above, his right hand clawing at the night before it grabbed the sword, his red cape unfurling above their heads, a banner of the blood yet to be shed. The murderer holds the lantern, but there is another light shining off the black armor, reflecting in the garden. The sinner creates the light, illuminating the drama in the dark, that tricks the night into allowing this betrayal to shine. Dreaming Pill, and this was uh, at a hotel in Pittsburgh with uh, Raymond Foy and uh, Wieners and, uh, and uh, the painter uh, uh, Clementi, and he was arguing uh, his phone bill with the, uh, the, front, with the front desk with his poem. It has something to do with that, I don't think it does at all. But anyway, uh, I wrote it as a prompt. Dreaming pill. Losing touch with simple pleasures. Your telephone is ringing roses. Your friends are infamous tippers. You have trouble believing in open windows and fire escapes. A dreaming pill to feel what you shall. Sleeping against your will. Falling through the limbs of night. To land where, e where you won't ever be. Soft pillow of abandoned hope. Plowing the fields of furtive feeling. Rebuilding a tiny tower. Tumbling through the sunlight. Splintered by the trust in trees. Uh, 
Gloss Star. Faded starlit shopping in star market and moving target. Well lit bar wit, harbor carpet, magic tar pit, calm before the trap door trip. Sea legs, fish nets, wish list, rack sets, land lips drinking up the thirst of goat of sinking ghost ships. Gloss Star. And uh I don't know where this came from, this is a really weird one, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. About to say in New Jersey, <clears throat> Mitchell gets angry, curses and bangs on walls when he hears certain words or phrases including New Jersey, Snickers, Mars, and Wisconsin. On Tuesday, the first day of his trial, he did not react when the phrase New Jersey was uttered twice within earshot. On Wednesday, he appeared to be holding his ears closed with his fingers when relatives testified about his problem. He told them he shot her because he thought she was about to say New Jersey. <laughs> she died recently. Details are not available. Her death was not related to the shooting. So I don't know what the fuck that is. <laughs> but I love it. Uh, uh, I and, yeah, I know. You see the game tape one in Philly, it was beautiful. They're John Dillinger and Hope said he's still that's what I said. They're John Dillinger and Hope said he's still alive. Two New York poems, particular Manhole covers, and they're kind of related. One's the night and one's the morning after. Manhole covers. The blast of never-ending night, the breath of ghosts exhaled. In walks death with a vote of candle. Manhole covers unveiled her secrets and cloudbursts of whispers. Taxis rumble, tires leak air of the times. Past the revolver tied in a knot. Shooting Gordian blanks. Tudor city trash trucks eat green doors at daybreak. Tudor City Trash Trucks. Tudor City Trash Trucks eat green doors at daybreak. We stand witnessing witness to the morning. Sounds of hydraulic consumption among the Tudor castles and awakening gardens girded and guarded by wrought iron armies. Sunday's sun points golden fingers at the dusky dawn between the mammoth castles bridged over 42nd Street. The Chrysler building flashes like a silver rocket before blast off. Rats and returning revelers seek shadows of safe return as little ladies of the morning are led into the light by French bulldogs plowing through morning crisp with an air. Enchanted boys stand in awe, throwing shade at the sidewalk, mutually pointing towards the sky, as if to say, Behold, the music of this magic morning is in the Tudor City trash trucks eating green doors at daybreak. I had this great plan to write all these alphabetical poems, and I did too, so... And then I stopped. So this is the end of that project uh, in the beginning. A bee. A bee catches daylight, entrapping flower-glazed honey in joyous kettle luster, making noises of pure quiet, reverberating, singing thrushes under violet windows, exulting yonder zen. Always been. Always been counting days enlisted for God's help. I just knew love meant nothing. Orange, oranges peeling quietly represent subtle tribulations. Unmet vigorous wishes, exact years zodiac. And uh, this is when I wrote, but I rewrote it. I guess with the current environment, I think it takes on new meaning. The backward blues. I can only see your crooked ways. Things so simple now have changed. I too am guilty. My path is paved. Name your poison, king, queen, or knave. Sending wishes and spending time. I don't have the luxury of a blue-collar crime. There's little left to shout about. The fear of fear, the rise of doubt. Put your hand in this wound of mine. Trust the injured. Lay your eyes down upon the pine. And uh, for, uh, the other project that I never completed was uh, taking different names of writers and then doing an anagram. So this is Jack Kerouac. It's our Kate, Jack. It's our cake, Jack. It's our cat, Blake. Eternity is a golden orb, heads too pure for dreaming. Loneliness shakes the glitter from the tassels swinging from the dancer's soul. The finger of God is heavy with the cloudy snow of Walt Whitman's beard pointing me out. A rucksack saint is stopped watchman in the palm of a trained symphony conductor. Sleeping in movie houses, dreaming in blurred road technicolor. Time is rubbing against you. You will deny yourself three times to the sweet nothing of the budding dawn. It's our cake, Jack. Suffer the day. In glorious tones. Uh, I'm getting to these poems I wrote right for people, and I'll get to them shortly. Um, these two, I thought they were really cool. Uh, just, ahem, is the title of this one, and then, ahem, <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> So this is the first one. <coughs> 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 
said to be that loud. Sorry about that. <laughs> Ahem. I clear my mind for miles, head full of invisible mountains, fist full of horizons, skirting the clouds, preparing to let fly the winged wind, separating the holy dreams of angels from the deflated balloon of the common man. Ahem. Ahem. Head full of invisible mountains and buffalo, I clear my mind for miles of half-forgotten trees, fistful of horizons lining the sun with the summer sea, skirting the clouds with a nimble glee, preparing to let fly the winged wind with a mind of its own, segregating the holy dreams of floating angels from the deflated balloon of the, balloon of the common man, dreaming them on the one bus rolling through Central Square, Boston behind me, God just ahead. I wasn't going to read this, but it's for Charlie, and Charlie passed away, and uh, I had this longer poem, and I, I just, I just, uh, I, uh, I really, really love this poem for Charlie, anyway. I miss him. He was such a unique dude. Uh, what should I do now? That's what Charlie would say to me at criticism, and I said, what should I do now? Should I, tears, can you, you know, and I would say, well, why don't you just hang out here for a while? I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's not there anymore, and it sucks. But anyway, I, I loved him, too. Him, Charlie, and... And, and uh, the good thing was that uh, he died, and they had a really great little thing for him, but they wanted to keep it small, so uh, uh, Bronski was worried about, uh, you know, the poets reading too long, and so Garrett came, and John Mulroney came, and it, it, it was a small number of poets, and then the activists read it. It was such a great little thing for Charlie, and it was right in the, and Audrey was there, and it was right in the basement of his, uh, of his uh, house, where so many crazy things happened, and I was loaded with cats, and it was so nice to be there and feel the spirit. So I miss him, dearly. What should I do now? For Charlie Shively. He sits crooked and bent towards the boredom of the moment. All tired eyes rest upon him. Tongues cluck roofs of mouths like thirsty dogs in an endless search. His voice and waves on the beach where secrets meet the sea. His mind a hawk of smoke, great wings of wind, talons of gathering fog. His wishes burn out halos of simple, saintly intent to make up his mind and go home. He just wanted to go. He was, uh, they had a Easter egg hunt the first year he was there. He was out there in his, uh, it was about a mile from his house, out there in his uh, wheelchair. And somehow they, they lost him, and he made it all the way to his house. He was knocking the door, let me in, I live here! <laughs> and uh, I don't know how many eggs he found, but he found his house, which is amazing. Uh, I'm going to read poems for a lot of women that I really respect and I really, really are good friends of mine. This first one's for Carol Weston. Ethereal. Winsome, lonesome, heavy days bring light sorrow. What to make of it? A string of words, invisible pearls, orbs of hollow delight. I mention those orbs a lot because at that dead show I saw people literally uh, sharing their souls. So in the dead, you know, I went to the dead shows and I never understood why people would cheer in the middle of a song, and then there was this wave of things that I didn't understand. But then I ate acid, and then I was I was on the wave, you know. I was a surfer, but I realized when 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 they when they open up and everything's cool, at least in Jersey, when I saw them, uh, I saw them handing these in the, these golden orbs, and I believe it was soul. And then when they got down to the the drum space and it got dark, then then I, I saw them cover up, and then it, they, so I saw the sharing and the mm -hmm. and the scaring. It was, it was amazing, but uh. <coughs> You now this is for uh, for Jane, a wild rope. Watching the parade and the drizzly, the drizzly rain from the hill of your house, you are to me a wild rope that refuses to be tied in obvious knots. Your photographic memory enhances your artisan's eye for children growing on trees. I hope that joke I now forget makes you laugh again. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys know Danusha Borshek. She's uh, Garrett's neighbor, and she's a great Polish translator. And, uh, Dor uh, Danusha, is it? Oh yeah. Is that Borshak? Bors I forget what it's Well, she translated uh, this great, crazy po a Polish writer, and uh, she's won several awards. And she, she wrote this great memo, or, uh, memoir about um, uh, her husband, American husband, helped her write it at the time. And she was, uh, uh, I think she was uh, uh, at the Harvard uh, Medical School. She was a psychiatrist for years, and she was Garrett's next door neighbor. And I know her pretty well, so I always promised that I'd go visit her, and this poem's about that. But the craziest thing was, right after Garrett died, um, I finally visited her, and she said, this weird thing's happened. People keep knocking at my door, like, at, at, in the middle of the night all the time, and it's kind of worrying me a bit. So, for a couple of days, she would hear knocks at the door, and I don't think it was related to Garrett. Somebody was coming to her door. It wasn't me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it was just a weird thing, like, I finally visited her. So this poem was written years, not years ago, but when I wrote all these poems for friends of mine, this is for Danusha, and she really is an amazing person. Every intention uh, for Janusha. 
So please go visit her next door to Garrett, but don't ring the doorbell and run. <laughs> so many times I had every intention of paying you a visit high on the hill across from the harbor. Now, a day after a beloved Polish poet passed on, I'm translating this thought to that feeling to these words. I still have every intention. Uh, and in 99, I was lucky enough to go up and visit Joy Kiger with a friend of mine who's a teacher, and we spent the whole day with her and Donald. So this is Miss Kidd's memory. For Joanne Kiger and Donald Gurevich. Time holds gravity for ransom. The trees bend graciously in our wake. There you stand in the pure light, smiling in shades. I was 23. John was 23. We were all 23. Mm -hmm. No answer on the other end of the century. Emerald Paradise. The magic outhouse where you said it just flowed out of you. The words. Shiny goodbye to you and Shelley Winters movie star sunglasses glowing all afternoon. In the happy haze, the hazy happiness, you slipped me something. All this every day. And it really was. And this is for Eileen Miles. That's the craziest dream about her and my dog the other day. We were at a, we were at a dog training place, and she said something really cool, and I can't remember what it was, but it, it was something dog-related. So, uh, About two years ago, there was this Coretta Kent thing, and we walked around Harvard Square, and Fanny was there, and we were supposed to write, Joe was there, poems afterwards. And I wrote all this great stuff, and I only used one line, and I'm like, I, I, I just didn't want to use what I had because I had to process it, so it's now duly processed. Um, orange traffic cones for Eileen Miles. Two white stripes guard the trunks of thinning trees, subway grades in square formation, ladder to heaven. He opened paths for our children to follow, waving a very special bubble wand. Bubble men in blue jackets conducting the wind, hollow crystal balls of emptiness floating just above the happy throng. Laughing man with a tuba cuts through the crimson crowd. Patch of light, single golden delight, single engine drone. Crossing the blue afternoon torched. A hint of what's built to come to fruition. A white streak of parallel time trails the inevitable shadows in transit on the windy water. And my one exception to the women is Bill, because uh, this poem sounds like it's really a... It picture slap at Bill, but it, uh, it, it is. No, <laughs> I love Bill to death. And, uh, uh, this thing is, 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 is something I really, really uh, I, I love him, and I, I, I think of him often, and I, I hope he's okay. Stubborn honey for Bill. Bill, you blustery bear. But I was stubborn honey with the, pre pre with the prerequisite bees, and the sting was so sweet. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Stubborn honey for Bill. Bill, you blustery bear, but I was stubborn honey with the prerequisite bees, and this thing was so sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we, Sister Credit Kent was uh, at, uh, they had a really cool exhibit there, so the part of that writing was, was, was uh, a lot to do with her, and uh, she was an outlier for Sister Credit Kent. Tiny tank, Ho Chi Minh lives in the boldest streak of blue. His crazy beard points downward, the man in the mountain whose face time erased. Rainbow splashed across the white tanks, gas vapors of dancing heaven come alive to the ghosts. Pull everything you can out of yourself, adjusting the volume on your holy vessel. There are no mistakes. Don't create and analyze. Enjoy yourself. It's lighter than you think. The Immaculate Heart of Mary inside your clocking tides. God's not dead. He's wonder bread. Water is life. Work in the commonplace, not the unworthwhile. The commonplace is a huge part of our landscape, surrounded by signs and shapes. Poets and artists notice the commonplace, colorful forms into the uncommon. Billboards and train yards, another landscape, grooming the silk. We have no art. We do everything as well as we can. Like medieval monks copying scripture to illuminate it, then illuminate it by it. A gospel for consumers familiar with the language market in the basement of a bodega. Taking your word for it, joyfully joined at the hip of something exciting. Love is here to stay, and that's enough. That should be enough. I should end in, and that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I have a couple more, then I can't wait to hear Amanda read. Because my big, you know, my, 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 my big fluff at the end is my poem for Amanda. Which is going to be a letdown now that I told it. But anyway. <laughs> the most mortal part for Fanny Howard. <laughs> The library of pigments, 50 colors or toxic, get very beautiful. Jars of vibrant rainbows of every hue imaginable. Vermilion made from ground toxic mercury sulfide. Indian yellow made from the urine of cows fed only mango leaves. Tyrian purple made from once royally expensive mollusk excretions. 
ultramarine blue azurite, malachite, rose matter lake, bone black made from charred animal bones, kermes, a red dye used by ancient Egyptians made by crushing lice that lived on oak trees, turkey red made in a torturous process involving mixing the roots of matter plants with sulfonated castor oil, ox blood, and dung. Mummy brown, made from actual mummies ground into powder for artists and cure-alls. Orpiment, so poisonous it was used as an assassination tool in ancient times. For some, the beauty outweighed the danger. Transmutations, bubble pop, repetition, reorganize, visualize again and again. Pop means people. Pop means color. The most mortal part of the poem is the pop ending. Uh, so I was uh, lucky enough to go to Pittsburgh again with John on the same visit, and uh, between uh, him and Creeley, uh, I caught a little whiff of what they were saying to each other, and it was mostly John probably wanted to go out and you know and buy like a mink stole or something, and and, then, and this was Bob's response, like because uh, John had to read still, and he, he wanted to go out and do stuff. We'll see, we'll see. Our dilemma is John, we've got this time, you know. I'd love to really. I mean, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> and uh, this is for uh, the cook, uh, Abby and Sammy, uh, Cook, Amanda's children. Children with open ears hear the hidden song in the silence. Children with widened eyes play in the space between the words with bobbing buoyancy. Children with pure spirit tickled forever ivory with spellbinding ease. And my last poem. Lunar Delight for Amanda. You knitted the moon and left a trail of wool across the night harbor waters all the way home. The untold joy and pain swirled in the clouds surrounding your face in lunar delight, barroom blues Monday night. A needled moon against the darkness of noon. Thank you very much. Hotel room with John Williams, Foy, yeah. and admitting to going to a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> this will be a historical video to get up onto YouTube. I had the same experience. Yeah, uh, without the this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was laying on the floor and with my girlfriend, because I would get off of work and we would eat and then sort of lay there dozing because yeah. we saw the dead so many times. I mean, they were playing everywhere all the time in, in San Francisco. And so it wasn't so precious. Yeah. And I remember I woke up and Garcia was hitting these notes and like this gold was flowing out of the guitar. And I remember sitting going, do you see that? And she's going, what? <laughs> and, and, but it was this beautiful moment where it just flowed out into the audience. And you constantly got that, that uh, feedback that yeah, going yeah. on between people yeah. and the band. And you could see them; they would get shoved by, by the feeling. And that's the community. So, uh, I mean, that's uh, when... Uh, what I didn't, I got lost in my introduction because the thing that Robert Duncan was saying about the importance of, of reading the poem was that the poem was not completed until you had read it out loud in front of, especially your peers. Mm -hmm. And there was that whole idea of, uh, that, that's where the whole idea of the dead that, that I, I argue with Joe about all the time, you know, the dead had some really bad shows. But there was, there were, there was this feeling of between them and the poets that I was encountering where they were all, you know, trying to get to some place, and sometimes you don't, and then sometimes you do, and it's this wonderful, glorious thing that you wait for, as we have been waiting. May I hold that, please? I will give it back and not lose your face <laughs> for this magnificent thing. Copies for sale for today. Please buy one. Support this press. Um, what Derek Finner has been doing with that press is just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of work uh, between him and Bill and a couple other people that we all know. Uh, I mean, they're, they're the people that have inherited uh, what Black Sparrow or somebody like that was doing as far as I'm concerned. And we have been waiting for this book, Miss Cook, as you have, uh, but you kept working on it, didn't you? It's, it's, it's bigger than it was in the beginning. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a, a wonderful thing uh, in my imagination to have this thing coming towards us and to now see it. 
Um, I, I can thank you publicly uh, for the book uh, and launching the book into the community, the way that you tend to this community, the way that you welcomed us all in Gloucester after Jared's death was extraordinary. And it was this rich, warm embrace when we all got up there. Uh, we were coming home. And that is what your poems do to me. That's what your work in poetry has done to me. It is the creation of coming home um, and the creation of visiting and the creation of the friendship as Jim was just beautifully setting me up to talk about because that's what's important in what we're doing. The rest of it somebody else has control over, not us. But for now, we have you with us. Please welcome. here while I'm reading. If any of you are origami people, I've started this crazy campaign to make 37,000 orange origami cranes to commemorate each life got lost to gun violence in a year. So if you're a crane folder, there's a basket of origami paper there if you're free to fold while you're listening. Um, and toward what Michael said about work and work not being real until you read it out loud, I'm going to take the liberty of reading something new. I'm sorry for reading it off my phone. My printer is out of ink thanks to Dungeons and Dragons and character sheets. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever have enough ink anymore. There, uh, I've been working on this project. It's a long and miserable project, and I can't say I enjoy it. But um, it's a reckoning of Olson's Maximus poems, where I read a Maximus poem and react to it and then do the next one, and the next one. And I've, this is the stuff that I haven't read in public yet that um, is starting in the middle, but toward the beginning of the middle, because it's a very big book and I have a lot of work left to do. So these are from my letter to Maximus. Um, and the, the title of each poem is the title of the Maximus poem that I'm reacting to. Maximus to himself. I have made my life out of the simplest things. A cup of coffee, a ball of yarn, a simple song sung under my breath. My life is full of ideas. Laundry baskets, dirty dishes in the sink, a jar of wilting roses. I can almost imagine you standing, saying your words as I stand, holding a basket of clean clothes against my hip, waiting to be dismissed. This morning the air was so cold the harbor was full of sea smoke. It rose around Ten Pound Island, meeting the clouds that hung at the horizon. I drove home knowing there was hot coffee in the pot. The song and dance of. See, that's just what I mean. I would be standing for hours waiting to fold the laundry. Everybody knows tomatoes taste better when you grow them yourself. Revisited February 7th, 2018. I am sure some man will tell me I am wrong. Tell me I am doing it wrong to the left and to the right and to the center, I want to bring all of them flowers. To the president in his wedding, I want to throw flowers at him, cover him, bury him in flowers until he is lost in fragrance and thorns. I want there to be something to feel, some life, some love. I want a bowl of oranges, a green glass bowl, but a man has thrown away the green glass bowl and the Orbitron and the rugs with all their patterns and magic. Take them out. These things, this beauty, these bits of magic pose a risk. I want a simple melody played on a piano in one end of a long room while the Orbitron whirs. Maximus to Gloucester, letter 14. I should tell you I don't really want to be doing this. I am tired of your sash weights, your man men, and your names. Mostly, I'm just tired. The great men are naked. They are losing their crowns. Everything about this, everything, feels like it should be left behind, except for the children. Suck your gums, old man. The children have had enough. Maximus to Gloucester, letter 15. Some sons talk about their fathers. Some sons keep quiet. Sometimes all we are left are stories to reconstruct. One, it is a gift knowing when to be quiet, when to use your voice. Two. There is broken glass at the base of Tablet Rock. I listen for the children as they climb, no run up the side. A tree grows from the split in the rock. I used to tell the kids to be careful. 
I don't bother anymore. Three. I am skipping three. Keeping quiet, as it were. Four. Some of us have worked the whole time. Letter 16. We have more, I hope, than how we make money. More than our things. We are more than we make. One. We can talk about what it means to lead, what it means to be a leader. We can talk about money and trusts. We can talk about pejorocracies. We would be talking, I think, about men. At least now, for when we have dismissed a woman for being too sly and put in her place a fool ready to make America great. How do we find good men? How do we make them? How can we keep men good? They spoil so quickly. <laughs> The rocks from Cressy's beach are all over the grass. The man-made wall couldn't hold back the storm. Two, this country, this country, motherfucker, they have pulled the rug from under our feet. Three, hush, we are talking back. So that's from... So thank you for that reminder. I, that. Um, I always thought, part of the reason I wasn't worried when this book took forever to come out is that I always thought that my mother would die right as the book was coming out. I just sort of had this feeling. And um, it was a shock to me when it was Garrett instead. So um, this book has a lot of ghosts in it, and I hope they're ghosts you love. Friday, October 24th. Barely waking, time for cleaning. Laundry, laundry, special ways for special stains. What in this house can't be vacuumed? Whites in the washer, water the plants. Some things are lovely enough to note, the way eyelashes cling to each other when wet, how tape laced along the road sparkles in the sunlight. Saturday, May 15th. Instructions for today. Take one lilac blossom from a bunch. Place the blossom in between your lips, crown facing out. Gently breathe in the nectar. Wednesday, November 10th. The thing about it is you never know when someone is thinking about you. My ficus tree is dropping its leaves. I haven't found a place it likes in this house yet. Ficus generation. I don't know what my options are, but for this, I must not add to the confusion. Two new valves for radiators. I will master this system by spring. I need a mirror and clear plastic, power tools and foam. I used to read things and hope they were written for me. I know better now. Thursday, January 13th. Talking today about family and lovers. A lesson in how to fall in love. A lesson in how to be in love. I had a dream the other night. I'll tell you about it later. Ran into a friend, not in the dream. Thought of you, all of you. I can't even remember who my friends are anymore. Give the baby three oranges and watch her roll them around. Take a walk in the cold. Remember that you have a body. Remember what that means. Sometimes these things come back to me. A smile, a hand, the way the phone rings. I am trying to make these things into rag dolls, not like poets do, but with fabric and yarn, most of it scraps. I wish you would call or write. I have more to say about lovers and more to say about family. Thursday, September 15th. Up early, downstairs, soups out again, still cold. Me dressed, Abby dressed. Forget shoes and sweaters and keys, gather quarters and leave. Walk downtown past the smells, smells of caramel and bread and coffee and donuts, past churches and chairs on the sidewalk and large appliances out for pickup, to the cafe, espresso for me, sesame cookie for Abby, Sicilian talk of soccer and socks. Out of money, go home or get more, to the bank, then to two sisters, too many dishes at home, and the instant decision not to wash them yet, not just yet. Call Garrett. Breakfast for me and Abby, Garrett and Greg talk about art and crotches, twice as much as for breakfast in the fort. 
walk home, sometimes raining, just a drop here and there, spitting, really, telling Abigail the names of the flowers. This is a morning glory. This is a rose. Maybe we'll eat every meal out today, and I won't do the dishes. This is hibiscus. Tired of measuring my value in cleanliness, look at the sunflowers. Graves of sea captains with ships on them, Ben Pine, Columbia. Ordered yarn last night, super bulky alpaca, colors like sunrise, seashell, seashell pink and thistle down and starlight blue. I may not clean at all today. The sky is opening and I've had too much coffee. That won't keep me from drinking more. Abigail making wookie noises and watching break dancing on television. <laughs> Something's got to give. <laughs> Wednesday, March 8th. Yesterday, clouds crouched over the city like tigers ready to pounce. Today, the air is warmer and the sky is blue. This morning, with a bad start, sick stomach and tired eyes, overheard conversations and a tumble down the front steps. Trying to fill the day with knitting and cleaning, trying to make that enough. Sweaters drying on the deck, dishes waiting in the sink. Sit out on sandy steps, watched trucks take trash. Hope for a better afternoon. Hope it is better before noon. Hope for better. Monday, June 5th. Feeling like an orphan. Tired, worn out, coffee in bed, slow waking, trying hard not to avoid things. People, phone calls. Mother quiet today, not hearing and not talking. The same questions again and again. I'm tired and I don't know what to do. We drive around and around. She isn't hungry. She's starving. Just a soda. Coffee. Salad would be good. I default and spend more than I should on lunch to have an easy place, a place she knows. For the third time this year, this is the first time we've gone. Dropping her off, she is tired and thankful. No words but thank you. Thank you for coming. Abby says her name. I say her name. Across the street, the near blind and the drunk are waiting to catch the bus. Saturday, December 30th. I didn't tell you about a dream I had a few weeks back. Pinochet's brain became part of my head at the back and a mob was leading me around the city looking for the right place to execute Pinochet. When they had me up at Will Arrest, I saw my sister in the crowd. I could feel his brain mixing with mine at the edges and I wanted to see him dead. All I could do was let the crowd lead me. Candies, fruit, and Jewish food are on sale. I buy chips for the party, cream to make more eggnog. The checkout, I see a can I thought was artichokes as chickpeas. The girl double bags glass bottles of pear juice. The boy puts them in more bags before putting them in my cart. Driving home, it is still snowing. This is what it will be like for her. White covering things she knows are there. Covering them until she questions what is there. Until she forgets what was there altogether. And then that anything was there at all. At home, Sam is coughing like a seal. Abigail is walking in circles, looking for chocolate, saying, I am so lucky. I am so lucky. Sunday, January 28th. I hope you know this is sort of like an open letter to all of you. Like to all my <laughs> friends. <laughs> and I'm thinking of people in this room I was writing to. And that's, that's a nice feeling. Trying to figure what it means to be remembered. Why it matters. A cold morning, I remember that. A boarding pass to Shannon, a present never mailed. Cleaning my desk, finding things I may have forgotten. A string of beads, an old violin, letters written, not mailed. Letters received and not returned. Trying to think of why it matters to be remembered. Graveyards full, full of people. Graveyards full of people I know, people I knew, people I remember. Graveyards full of forgotten people. Smiles of a summer night, my grandmother feet on the coffee table, drinking coffee out of a small white mug and watching old movies. I remember the swans swimming, candles growing, long tails. What of this remembering? Red velveteen, smoking on walks around the block, then only in the bathroom, then not at all. Cherries soaked in her Manhattans, eating oranges before bed. I tried this morning to remember my father's voice, how he answered the phone, gave advice. I'm not sure I got it, but I remembered the way he looked when there was nothing he could do. I remember his look, sympathy, empathy. Looking down at, the, at my son at my breast, what does it matter more than this? 
ice on the inside of the window, his body warm against mine. What does it matter to be remembered? His looking up at me, his eyes, he won't remember, but that moment will do. Cleaning my desk of ways to be remembered, yarn to knit a sweater, pictures of my babies, beads and silver, fabric for quilts, letters and bills and bills and bills. The rug by the door is stained black from the shoes of a man who repaired the boiler. Tuesday, March 6th. Quiet omens in the night. A gate left open, the bone we found in the graveyard, a flag flapping against wrought iron. Oh, Molly, while they are talking, I am thinking of you. Tuesday, April 3rd. Just got home and I'm trying not to cry. It's not that there's anything to cry about, but sometimes the part of me that is you comes through and I just don't know what to do about it. I think the old man across the street died today. Old women looking worried, coming and going with their dyed hair, coming and going all week, and now they've stopped. The woman in the next house down is on bed rest, so she sits in the front porch smoking cigarettes, lets the dog out. I don't know how much longer before the baby comes, but I'm worried. I've got that fuzzy feeling in my head like I should be doing more, or else, like I should be doing else, like somebody has decided my decisions aren't right. I hate them for it. Tuesday, April 24th. The shape of it all coming to me, coming back to me. Pilings rising from the waters like the giant's causeway. The same thing happens over and over again. The weather is changing again. Warm air comes in the windows and heats the rooms upstairs. The girls walk down the street in as little as they can manage. Bass pours out of the cars. The drunks walk home at night. The city breathes with slow breaths, deep, making sure they don't lose their step. Tuesday, May 15th. A cool morning, rain falling on yesterday's laundry. Last night, the air was full of blossoms. It made a kind of mischief in me, like May Day girls dancing in white. It felt like cherry blossoms, and cherry blossoms feel like you. I tried to call you, dropping Garrett off as the late morning sun broke through the rain, looking back through his jungle, the taste of sorrel in my mouth. The air smelled like rain and earth and rain on earth, and I missed you. I dialed your number. That is all that came of it. Thursday, June 21st. These days, the sun comes up with birds a twitter and babies crying for the breast. The coffee is hot and the cream is sweet. These days, the greens are from the garden. These days, the morning dew is just enough to keep the garden happy. We have jobs to help us buy drinks. We have dryers to pile papers and fabric on. We have babies to sing them to sleep. Today, I may bake a cake with almonds and butter and lemon. I will drink more coffee than I mean to. I will not open the mail. You ask me what I am looking for. What can I possibly say? Tuesday, July 17th. A lot of these are written on Tuesday because mm -hmm. it's really late Monday morning that they're written. I would go up Monday night still to my local, and that was my me time. And coming home drunk at one in the morning was the only time I had alone. Mm -hmm. so, so there was a lot written on Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning again. It always seems to come. The babies are coughing, doctor in the afternoon. Find a hammer, do all the chores that need a hammer, fix the curtain rod, pound a loose nail. If I had 20 minutes, I would pull the dried peas out of the garden. I would water plants, pick flowers. Find a pen, do all the chores that need a pen, thank you notes, bills, make a list of things to do. If I had 20 minutes, I would piece together a picture of fabric, black and white and red, like I am thinking of you, right angles and spirals, black and white. Turn the computer on, do all the chores that require a computer. Check email, reply to friends, waste time. If I had 20 minutes, I would tell the birds stories that would make them grow teeth to bite the stones from cherries. Tuesday, July 31st. <laughs> These days, I'm baking scones for neighbors, making whales of old fabric, saving bottle caps and pull tabs. 
Sunday morning the sun rose first like a pink ghost, then orange with a red halo, and finally bright and bold and yellow. I am making stories out of hellos and goodbyes and writing middles where nothing was before. I am making myself giddy with thin air. Today I locked the keys in the car and breathed reconditioned air. I ate bland food and sat through idle chatter. I bought diapers and fabric and buttons and bug spray. I didn't care through all of it because I am using my imagination. I am making characters to suit my needs. They gather little bits of quiet exuberance and try to build a life of it. Thursday, August 16th. Tonight I am despondent, quiet in the face of it. Days go by and I can ignore the way things are, the way they will be. I thank every one of you who distracts me. There is a rash on her side, a sore on her face. One is caused by bugs crawling out of her skin. The other is from blood dripping out of her ear. I recommend a bandage and a cotton dress. More time spent looking for heart-shaped rocks, less time wandering around rooms alone. There is a pit in my stomach, an empty feeling in my head. I'm going to try a drink. Thursday, September 27th. The thing about letting everything go to seed is that the birds love it. They hop about the yard, past the mustard and thistle. The whole thing is a place to hide. Reading translations in the tub after everyone else is asleep. I'm not sure where I fit into it all, the elbows and the wool, but the piece of it. I have been ignoring my mother lately. That is not true. What I should say is that sometimes when I wake at night, I let myself think of something else, and I am happy. Monday, October 15th. The house is cold again, today like yesterday and the day before. I won't turn the heat on. An hour at the market, at, and at the end of it, the fear of not being able to pay. Electrical glitch last week, expected money absent all weekend. I packed the cold things together in case my card didn't work crossed fingers. It did. Leaks from Friday at Appleton Farm and potatoes from last week's sale on the stove. Everything I do gets quickly undone, and I do it again. All day this way. Clean up blocks, sweep the floor, fold laundry, repeat. I'm listening to songs I shouldn't bother listening to. They fit the futility of the day. Only recently familiar and already like old friends. The sheets are in the wash. This is recycling week. The soup on the stove is warming the kitchen a little, and there's coffee almost ready to drink. I might slip away and ignore the whole thing. If you think I'm crying for you today, you are less than half right. Outside on the smoking deck, Blue's inside, and they're joking, show it, they say, and he lifts his shirt under his arm, the tattoo, the numbers, sniper's numbers, and I can't help but think of what they mean, what sniper means, what marines means, and I say something about peace and go inside, and I am sitting there, standing, my eyes are tearing, and an older man talks to me, sits, tries to cheer me up, tells me not to change the world, not to try, says it's okay, but I'm thinking about numbers and snipers and murder and death. And I'm thinking about babies and children and parents, and I'm thinking about parents and dead children and death, and I'm crying, and the band is playing, and the whiskey's gone, and I'm crying. So I go outside, and I go back outside and talk to him, and he's fine, it's okay, I'm crying about numbers and dead children. And he knows, he agrees, and he shows me a picture of his boy, 12 years old, and he talks about war, about being young, about politics and love and green energy. And in the end, we are talking about Colorado and the weather, and in the end, we are talking about baseball. <laughs> Saturday, December 29th. Two days after Christmas in the emergency room is full. <coughs> she didn't know what she was doing, a week's worth of pills. 42 pills, a week's worth. In the next room, a man has taken something and fallen off of a fishing boat. He is cold. He screams for two hours while they try to figure his, out his name. Down the hall, a little girl is so sick they send her straight to children's. An old woman wanders the room, from room to room doing EKGs. We watch as her heart speeds up and slows down. We wait to be moved. A woman with chest pains sits and waits alone. A man with a blown out knee waits on a stretcher. The next day when I go to the hospital to, to visit, I find a slide on the wet pavement, the corner of the public garden by Beacon in Arlington, the corner I sat in so many times. 
The edge of the statue shows, and I remember what it says. Neither shall there be any more pain. Thursday, January 24th. At the cafe, a woman sits with her back to me talking to a photographer. He tells her the story of each picture, and as he is talking, I can imagine what each one is. The bow cutting across the water, the gravestones, the buildings. My mother is late. I drink more coffee than I should, waiting for her. Sam eats cream cheese off of a bagel. He reads a book. When she gets there, she's all a flutter, bags of canvases and paints. I get her a cup of coffee. I get her rye toast. We work on her homework, lists of things, categories, lists of how, thing, how to do things. We go to her house. As she learns to find her words, Sam crawls under the table, around the chairs. By the time we are done, he is covered in dog hair. We drive downtown doing this week's homework, how a fence is different from a wall, how they are the same. When I pick Abigail up, she is holding an invisible baby bird in her hands. She asks us to be quiet so the baby bird can sleep. By the time we get home, the baby bird is awake. She lifts her hands out of the car door and lets it fly away. Thursday, September 30th. Today, everything feels like a punishment. Sitting at my table, big tears rolling down her cheeks, big tears rolling onto my arms and dripping onto the floor. I get the softest napkin we have to dry her face, hold her head to my bosom, and dry her tears. He wants her to have a baby, she thinks. In the shed, she has an antique hospital bed, an antique crib for babies. He wants her to have a baby, and she can't do it. She counts her babies. One, two, three, four. She counts ten babies. It is too much. She flicks her hand. Shh. Her babies are all gone. She is done with them. Thursday, October 13th. Wandering in a haze, trying to find a place to be. Everything I touch has a history of its own. Each room filled, full of the past. Me stuck in the middle, in piles. My children will be home soon. I will find comfort in their needing me. Monday, February 6th. Today she said my name. She hasn't said my name in a long time. I said my name, and then she said my name. It could have been any name. It was my name. Tuesday, April 24th. Sometimes it's Monday and you wake up with dread in your throat and you're thankful it's a school lunch your kids will eat and you can't find their folders and it's Monday and it's raining but you make the bus and after you feel like giving up so you call a friend and it's Monday. She meets you for coffee and you haven't seen her since Friday and not last Friday and you talk and talk and it all feels better and you go home to Monday and make the calls you don't want to make like the vet because your cat has cancer and the tumor is growing into her left eye and the pediatrician because your kid has fluid in his left ear and the insurance company because they made the checkout wrong and now you are short $900 and you call the editor of the local paper because they pissed you off and you leave a message because it's Monday morning. And you go to the vet and the cat bleeds all over everything and when you ask when is the right time they don't tell you and you pay a hundred bucks then you come to home to drop off the cat and go to Marshall's to buy socks to bring your mom and when you get there she is crying, she is always crying every Monday. And you feed her fatty pot roast and mashed potatoes until she won't open her mouth and you walk around around and around, and Fred, Fred the Eugene O'Neill scholar who taught your friends sits in the hall and he calls all of the bothers and bitch, and she is, so you laugh and you sing to your mother, you sing songs she sang to you, and you sing little boxes, little boxes on the hillside, and they're all made out of ticky-tacky, and Fred sings along and claps his hands and bangs his tray for the first time, and they're all made just the same. You leave right at two to get the kids to bring them to the doctor, and you talk to the school nurse about how stupid a stupid book was, and the kids come down the hall in their raincoats and into the car and to the doctors where they don't see fluid and your son fails a hearing test in his left ear but he gets a sticker and you go home and pick all the girly clothes from your daughter's dresser to be passed along because she isn't girly anymore. You start to make dinner and you burn it and your daughter spills milk and the whole thing is a mess of messes until the kids go up to bed. You take a quick bath, shave your legs, don't wash your hair, clean the sink and go upstairs. You hang up the clothes on the foot of the bed, pick up a dress for the night, and shoes, heels, and a sweater, make the kids' lunches, and leave. 
Monday night now, bar filling friends and musicians and kids young enough you don't care what they think and beer tonight, knitting out and a book to return and someone says they wish they had a washboard and you have one in your car. So you go get it and he plays it with your keys and the old washboard from a friend's garage and you buy drinks and stand up because it's Monday and you're tired and the kids get up to play the weight and fisherman's blues and you decide not to sit down, more beer and dancing with the girls and at the end they play songs for you, dirty rock and roll. And your friend plays the washboard and sings Bowie, and you dance till you notice your feet hurt, and you remember working ten hours tomorrow on the same feet, and you slow. It is Tuesday now, Tuesday, and Monday was all right. Tuesday, January 13th. It's hard these days to find a thing to say. I mean, to find a thing to say that someone might say something back to. It's hard to have something to say. Some, it's hard to have someone say something back. It is all too much. Last night there were six drummers waiting to play. They each had their own style. One a little more uptight. Another had a flick of the wrist. One played earnestly. One without a care in the world. I was happy listening to each of them. Today at the kitchen table we talked about words and poets and people. The sun was shining through the dirty window behind him. That window is my window, I thought. I am a housewife with dirty windows. I should clean that window, I thought. I know I won't. I don't know what makes better words, or better drummers, or better poets, or better people. I know what makes a window dirty. It is dirt on the window. <laughs> Somehow you missed the bucket, that money goes to the poets for all the work they just did in front of you. Um, a couple of bits of business that are coming up uh, that I don't think you know about my plans. Um, and that is that uh, for next season, uh, I'm not quite sure of the timing of this yet, but um, I am proposing that we um, do a complete reading of the first edition of The Heavenly Tree. Uh, and I want as many voices participating in it as possible. If everybody in the room is there to read, that's fine. Uh, and uh, people will take on more than one poem. It, it, this is where it is in my head at the moment. Um, but if you have interest, um, I'll put a, uh, some kind of a notice that you know, we're rolling now uh, after the summer gets started, and then we'll start getting together and figure out how we're going to do this. But if you have interest, let me know. Um, next up here uh, on June 10th, Yes, June 10th, Michael Bowen and Andre Spears. Uh, Mr. Bowen, you may know, uh, did the editing work on the HD book by Robert Duncan, but is a marvelous poet himself, as is Andre Spears. So it's wonderful back in there. And that will finish the season out for us. And then we'll be looking ahead to next year. I can't thank you two more. Uh, this was extraordinary. I saw gold coming out of you. <laughs> no, I need that. I need that. I, I've got it in my head. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you. There's food.